Mr. Paul Thompson, Spitfire Audio, and uh, we're in again in another very gentle and uh, uh, um, um, mellow hotel room where we can uh, hear what you're up to uh, here yeah. at the NAM show. So yeah. you've got this new library. Um. We have, yes. So we've um, collaborated with Olafur Arnolds, um, who's the BAFTA winning TV composer and uh, recording artist, for um, a new library which is called Chamber Evolutions. And what we have here is a group of string players. Um, it's exactly the same size as our Spitfire chamber strings section, so if you're familiar with that, then it'll sound very familiar. Um, but it's split up into four first violins, three seconds, three violas, three cellos, and three basses. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a nice, rich sound, but it's quite an intimate sound as well. And Olaf has come up with a couple of innovations in this library, things that um, we haven't done before. And they're, they're very, very useful for um, track, track making, but also for TV and games composition, film composition. So I'm just going to show you a couple of those things now and explain how it works. Now, across the keyboard, the, the performance has been done not section by section, but um, very uh, gradually blending from one section to another across the keyboard. And what Olaf has also done is he's got the players to what he calls feather in and out. Um, and he's, he has a collaborator who's the leader of this string section, Victor, who he's worked with a lot. So it's this idea that you can, if you have certain players coming and going and not everybody is playing all the time, then you get a much more intimate and detailed sound. And it actually sounds really interesting because you can hear the individual players more clearly. So I'm going to show you that that's the first innovation. The second one is these waves. And what this is is... Um, they're a kind of uh, what we would call in Italianate music language a crescendo and then diminuendo. So a kind of rising up from nothing and then falling away to nothing. And that's a really useful kind of arc sound um, um, or a wave, if you like. And we've recorded these at four different lengths and with three different kind of techniques. So it sounds like this. So you can either use it like that to make a kind of statement chord, or you can actually use it as a, a gradually undulating. Like that. And then if you look, we've, we have got slightly longer ones. And then shorter. It's a very, uh, it has a real kind of atmosphere to it, isn't it? Yeah, really yeah. Nice. And great notes being played as well, obviously. Oh, of course. <laughs> and then we've got a kind of uh, tremolo version. And then a vibrato -y and maybe more kind of um, a more feathered bow sound. They're very uh, um, mellowly played. I mean, it's not an aggressive yeah. playing technique, is it? It's no, very exactly. Sort of atmospheric and exactly. Flo floaty. Exactly. Yeah. This is the the whole point of this is to get um, atmosphere and texture into your tracks and it actually works really well i'll show you actually, we'll switch over to the evo grid um, which is the other part of the library um, so this is um kind of modeled you know the the design of this and the kind of way that you have this pegboard approach is almost like the old putney synth but basically it's still orchestral recordings it's these violin section again feathering the players in and out of each other but across the keyboard, you have these different kind of cells here. And you can set them either all to have the same sound in, or the same evolution, as we call it, um, or you can set them to be different ones. Ah, so you can have real... So you can have a real mixture across right. the keyboard of sound. Now, the, the beauty of, um, of these evolutions is that it, it's, it's, like a, it's a, something that you can hold down, and it just evolves really slowly and gradually. I'm going to show you... This is the most vanilla sound, uh, evolution number one. I'm just going to hold it down. So 
So you can hear that there's a certain amount of movement in there, but there's nothing really quite, really kind of obvious going on. Um, and if we move on to uh, set up another one here, this one we've we've randomised, but within the first section of the library. And I'll show you how this. You've got a randomised dice up here, and this shows you how the sections are designed. So there's subtle effects at the beginning. Then we've got thrills, which is like sudden one player emerging out and, and giving a kind of, whether it's a tremolo thing or a, or a you know, sudden crescendo, sudden kind of swelling of sound. Um, episodic, which is where things are really clearly and audibly moving over time. And then dissonant, which is, again, it's like that kind of, um, it's the musical terminology for something that isn't in the doesn't sound like it's in the key that you're playing. So sort of great for tension, I'd imagine. Exactly, sort of, yeah. yeah. So I'll show you the first one that I've popped up is this, is this subtle uh, randomization. And in fact, I can, yeah, let's just juggle the dice again. Yeah, it's almost, it's almost, Compositional in the way it isn't is, it? The yeah. Dynamically compositional. Dynamically right? compositional. That's exactly it. And the idea is that it's you're still writing your own music, um, but you can hold down one single note, and it, all that happens is that note. But it gives you a real feeling of texture and dynamism. Is is the word that we've used in the past. Um, this is really an interesting way. It's something that when you are working with live players, it's really you know, straightforward to get them to do this kind of stuff. But if you're trying to show somebody, you know, maybe you're working with a, on a TV show with a director and you want to show them how you can use, you know, what the benefit of having a few live players on is, is to, to your piece, you can show them that this really gets, um, it really gives a feeling of texture to your piece. Like so, life, yeah. yeah it's, well, it's, it's not I mean, static. because the human brain is so sensitive to repeated phrases and, and, and you know and, and repetition it can pick yeah. it up really easy exactly it? exactly so it's a really good way of either either use it on its own and it's a really great compositional tool very creative and inspiring or you can use it with other string libraries or orchestral libraries or you know with you know your piano basses and stuff like right, that to sort of add the... to add texture ah, okay. and life and something that your your brain can kind of pick up on in the background so it's like you're squeezing the essence of Oliver out of him and, and, and passing <laughs> it on to the end user yeah that's exactly it we put him through the mincer and uh, and this is what came out the other end so i'm going to show you the next section so this is the thrills section of the library so as you see it's the second section there and this is color coded blue now the the beauty of this um, peg system is that you can see which notes are triggering you can write something and if you think oh that f sharp wasn't um, wasn't really what I wanted to do then you just move the peg somewhere else uh, okay play it back and you can so does that that's just for each particular octave so these are like zones on the keyboard so right. that's the root notes of that zone so the d sharp 2 um, and then a couple of notes on either side, and then the next one being G-sharp to, so, and it goes all the way up to the top of the keyboard. Right, I see. So if you like, those are your kind of regions, yes. and then within yes. you can set each region to have any of the evolutions. So this one sounds like this. So you get the different, idea. Different amounts of coffee before the recording session. Like, uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, so it's uh, you get the kind of sense of individual players. That's yeah. The, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to give you an example of. We've got the episodic, but the dissonance is probably um, the most different sounding part of the library. So that one sounds like this, and I, I'm going to hold down just a, a simple, like an open um, fifth and fourth here, so that you can hear exactly what's going on. It's a nice effect, a slightly Portsmouth yeah. Symphonia sort of uh, aspect to it. But, <laughs> yeah, but, it's also, it's but also controlled. There on the other. Yeah, controlled, exactly. Intentional. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, um, that's a, a kind of interesting way of, um, of getting something where, you know, you might even only use one note on that. You might have, you might randomise, let's say we randomised. I mean, you can obviously go through and set this up totally 
um, for. So you can randomize between each of the. So you don't. They, you can have sort of mellow randomization combined with yeah. dissonant randomization. Exactly. Right. So this is with any, so across the whole grid, which if I scroll back across here, you'll see it's a little bit wider than the screen. But also, if you want to, if you want to kind of go slightly skewed towards uh, this section, the most kind of standard section, then you can just randomize with invisible, um, and then it gives you that um, focus. So I'm going to drag this back over here so we can see we've got these two ones up here. But if I just play something now, So you can see, and also you can see from the keyboard down here where the zones are and what um, region of the keyboard is operating with which section of the Evo grid. And you can, you know, you can just keep randomizing. It's a great way to, for instant inspiration. I mean, it's a really useful writing tool because it can just sparks ideas straight well, away. Well, I guess also after you've recorded the MIDI, you know, you can then just randomize and see what comes yeah, out of the mix. Yeah. exactly. And you can go back in, you know, if you like everything apart from that one note at the end, like I say, you can... Uh, you can literally just take take this peg here and remove it, um, or you can set it to a different, you know, part of the Evo grid. Oh, really, really straightforward. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of so sense. So it's kind of like the, um, you know, like I say, it's like it's that kind of, it's like a it's like a pegboard synth, you know, being wiring in different sections to get different effects. So if I just um, the last thing that I'd like to show you is to look at the different microphones and. As with all of our um, products, we record with a variety of different microphones and microphone positions. And the reason for this is that one of the things when we started out, we wanted all of our tools to be really able to be personalized. And so one of the great ways of doing that is to record with different microphones because you can, as an end user, you can say, well, I absolutely want something that really sounds right here with very little reverb, or I want something that is really distant. And one way to hear that is if I just pop up these, um, these trams and we listen to the different mics, then here's the first, the cl really close mics. And then here are the most distant mics, to give a, an example. Oh, that's not, you really, I mean, that's a very radical difference. Yeah, here is the Decca tree. So still some sense of space, but a bit more immediate. And then here is a stereo pair, like a kind of stage pair. So you've got four different oh, that colors. stereo image is radically different on those. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. and that's the thing. I mean, people, it's, it's kind of like, a, it's one of those things that is so blindingly obvious when you actually sit and think about it, but it's not necessarily immediately um, apparent to us that you move the mics around, you're going to get a totally different sound. I suppose the thing is, is you know, you t I mean, it, it depends on how one uses orchestral stuff. If it's more of a sort of, it, it's it, whether it's foreground or background kind of work. And yeah. I guess, you know, it's more about the envelope and perhaps the reverb for, you know, on a basic level. Yes, exactly that. It's also the space. And so this is recorded in Air Studios in Lyndhurst Hall. Um, which is a wonderfully shaped building, but it also has galleries and it's got a really kind of random um, scattering of after the kind of early reflections. What, what happens is very, very chaotic to the extent that we were once recording a uh, contrabass tuba in there and the player was sitting on one side and the tree mic on the other side went over um, the further mic. So it's one of those really strange things that you're always going to get a slightly unexpected and random response from the room. Now the beauty of that is this, it's very, very different to take something close mic'd and then apply reverb to it. And then even if it's a, um, you know, an IR, a, a impulse response reverb of a, of a real room. Yeah, it can't be that detailed, can it? It's never, it's never the same. And the, the, dis, the difference between putting the mics up very high in the room, like these ambient mics here, and listening to what that sounds like, nothing at all like reverb on a dry sound. So this is the, um, there's all kind of things as well, like the, the way that the frequencies fall off over distance and all of that kind of stuff as well. So having this controllability means that you can tailor the sound to be exactly your personal taste and maybe specific to a project, but you can make it sound very different. And so 
you don't you lose that um, element of of somebody hearing you know a certain sound in a on a show or on a you know commercial or in a film and going oh yeah I know what that is that's that pattern. I guess that's quite important when you're working for media composers as well because everybody's looking for a unique sound and something that's kind of and they can still get that even though they're using a library that perhaps somebody else is using as well right yeah that's exactly it that's exactly it and that was always one of our prime focuses. Um, you know, to get to have life in the recordings and a kind of really real feeling of humanity, but also to have very it very controllable. And the other thing that we're very proud of is that we are a company in the middle of the recorded recording industry in the UK. We pay all of our players royalties on sales of the products, so um, everybody shares in the success of the product. And I think it's. Um, it's, it's in, been, been able to kind of give us a really good relationship with players who have been our friends since way before Christian and I started recording sample libraries. And we always felt that that was a really important part of the process. And it means that, you know, that um, the players are really enthusiastic about doing yeah. the projects. And they, when they were doing these, this project in particular with Olafur, you know, they were really excited by the creativity that he and Victor were bringing. I imagine because I imagine recording a sample set as a as a uh, orchestral musician can be tedious as hell. You know, because you've got yeah. to do, you know, that now and again, and this with all these different techniques and all these different voicing, and you know, it could be quite challenging. I'd imagine. Exactly, it can be really hard work, and so, you know, something like this where there's, um, you know, a certain amount of creativity and immediate direction and kind of conducting the sound and saying, oh no, hang on a minute. Can you do this if you do that? And involving the players in the, you know, in the process. It's a bit different from just being presented with a set of long yeah, notes. Yeah, because I guess if you're uh, producing the session and you notice that one particular uh, string player is, is smashing it and you go, well, you take that voice and you, you, know, you, can, get, yeah. you can allocate on the day rather than you know, pre-plan everything. Right? Exactly, exactly. And it makes it more interesting for the players because it's, it's a bit different and it engages you know, your kind of creative part of your brain which is the last thing that you'd expect i wonder if sample. they get the same thing as uh, you know when one gets when when one's kind of done just regular one shot samples where you go oh, i know that one where you get the string player who's watching tv or a film they go oh that was me you know that that particular <laughs> i recognize that exact thing you know just that yeah. one line from an, a cluster of a chord or whatever yeah, yeah. i think it's le it's less easy to spot now but because of you know the all of the kind of round robins and all of the microphone positions and all that kind of stuff but um, when you, you, you do have, players are kind of able to hear themselves really clearly, even through all of that. And I think that uh, it's been interesting because we have had, you know, with the very first percussion library we did with Joby Burgess, who's an incredible percussionist. Um, he found that, um, you know, the, that he was getting composers who were using the library and had fallen in love with his playing, which is, you know, all percussionists play d differently. And they'd fallen in love with his playing, with the sound of the Hall of Air, and they booked him and then came to record their film at air. So there's a, a kind of knock-on effect, which is really great, that, you know, the, that we're kind of saying, singing to the world the praises of right. the musicians. That, so you need so. a, you, so you, a, your sideline should obviously be some kind of booking agency as well, so you can... <laughs> Make for yeah. both ends and also get everybody work. That'd be awesome. I think booking, yeah, from my experience of booking agencies with yeah. Hilary Skews and Isabel Griffiths who do all, all our bookings, um, it's such an insanely complicated job. Actually, way more complicated than making sample life. I can imagine, yeah. yeah. So, I guess uh, it's pricing, information, and uh, footprint, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. So the library is available at the moment on special offer because it's just released. So we have a promo. Um, it's reduced from two nine nine dollars down to two one nine. Um, the if you go to our website spitfireaudio.com, you'll see there's a ton of information here. Um, all the technical information that you need about the library and, and how it works and what software it works in. Oh, there's, that's you. There's me. Yeah, lots of walkthroughs and really great interview with Olaf as well. Um, some demos and all of the key stats appear on the page for every product. So, uh, so 38 gigs of uh, space required during, during install. During install, yeah. So it's just over 30 gigs of uncompressed samples and then we've used a compression to get it down to just under 20. So installed, once you've finished, 20 gigs of sounds. Um, and yeah, and it's a, it's a, I've really enjoyed using this. It's um, found it to be a very creative and inspiring writing tool. Um, and we hope that you're going to enjoy using it. Paul, thank you very much. Thank you very much.